Let's kick this list off with a weird one. A mysterious sickness known as Havana Syndrome. For quite some time now, the US and Cuba have had a, let's call it a tumultuous relationship. Back in 2015, however, the United States government officially reopened their embassy in Havana and sent some of their finest agents and officials to work there. Even though there was still a lot of tension between the two nations, everything appeared to be hunky-dory over at the embassy. That is, until late 2016, when an American CIA operative started hearing a strange buzzing noise in his apartment. The buzzing caused an uncomfortable feeling of pressure in his head. At first he figured it was cicadas or crickets outside his window, but that turned out not to be the case. The mysterious, insect-like buzzing wouldn't let up, and the agent began suffering from dizziness and chronic headaches. Things got so bad that he sought medical attention. A report was sent to Washington. Since this was just a one-off case, nobody paid it much attention. No investigation was launched into the matter, and business continued as usual. In February 2017 though, two more agents reported hearing the same strange buzzing. This time, it caused more serious symptoms. They not only suffered from headaches and dizziness, but also motor issues and tinnitus. Whatever this strange sound was, it only seemed to be affecting US personnel stationed at the Havana Embassy, and it was seriously doing a number on their brains. The symptoms were the same as in patients with damaged inner ears. When confronted by the head of the US Embassy, the Cuban government denied any wrongdoing. The Americans launched an investigation into both the Cubans and the Russians, but didn't find any evidence to link them to the buzzing sound. By March, even more American personnel came forward with similar symptoms. Motor issues, extreme migraines, vertigo and tinnitus. Some of these personnel didn't even report hearing the buzzing sound at all, and they'd just fallen sick out of the blue. They called it Havana Syndrome. As the months went by, more and more Americans stationed in the Cuban capital began to fall prey to it. By September of that same year, 16 CIA agents alone had been affected, along with many other civil servants. A doctor was sent to treat them. He too fell sick. Those affected by Havana Syndrome soon began developing other symptoms. Insomnia, nausea, fainting, vision loss, frequent nosebleeds, and most worryingly, signs of brain damage. They were struggling with severe memory loss and became unable to concentrate on anything. These cognitive issues were making it difficult for them to complete even simple tasks and lasted for months after being exposed to the mysterious buzzing sound. Due to the secrecy of the CIA's investigation, we don't know exactly how many staff members were affected by the syndrome, but we do know that at least 40 personnel fell sick. Their brains were examined using advanced imaging techniques. The results of these tests were then compared with the control group. In July of this year, the report was published. The 40 staff members affected by Havana Syndrome had significantly less brain matter than the control group. They also had problems with functional connectivity in their brains. It then came to light that Canadian officials in Havana were being affected too, 14 of them in total. Both the US and Canadian governments were convinced that some sort of radio or electromagnetic weapon was being used to attack their workers, but couldn't pinpoint exactly who was responsible or what sort of device was being used. Both governments withdrew all their non-essential personnel from Havana. The 14 affected Canadians sued their government for $28 million for failing to address the Havana Syndrome problem. Their lawsuit is still ongoing. As of right now, we still don't know who or what was responsible for the buzzing. Some people think that the syndrome was the result of some environmental issue, and that it really was just the constant sound of crickets or cicadas that affected the workers' brains. And that doesn't explain why only US and Canadian government officials were affected though. The whole thing's very suspicious, and theories range from Cuban, Russian or Chinese sabotage, to the whole thing simply being an unidentified virus that spread around the embassies. Since it's such a recent phenomenon, we might actually uncover the truth on this one. If the American and Canadian governments don't keep the whole thing secret, that is. It seems they're doing their utmost to keep their investigations under wraps. Understandable, I suppose. 
For anyone wondering what this mysterious buzzing sounded like, I'm about to play a short recording taken by one of the US agents. Don't worry, the clip isn't long enough to fry your brain. Probably. If you don't want to hear it, pause the video now and use the timestamp in the description to skip to the next entry. For the curious amongst you though, here it is. In this next entry, we'll explore a truly intriguing, yet morbid case that's remained unsolved for the past 82 years. Step inside my time machine. The year was 1937. The setting? Beijing, then known as Peking. 19-year-old Pamela Werner was the adopted daughter of an established British diplomat and had spent the vast majority of her life in the Chinese capital. She was fluent in Mandarin, knew her way around the city well, and had many friends who she socialized with frequently. On a cold evening in January, Pamela went ice skating with her friends. She was due to leave for London in a few days to further her education, and wanted to spend some quality time with the people she cared about the most. At around 7pm, Pamela said goodbye to her friends. This would be the last time they'd ever see her alive. The next morning, Pamela's mutilated corpse was discovered by the last surviving section of Peking's Ming Dynasty Wall, only a short walk from her home. Her ribs were broken, and many of her organs had been cut out. Her heart, kidneys, liver, and bladder were missing. Her throat had been slashed open so deeply that her head was almost severed. Her right arm was barely still connected to her torso. The frozen ground around her was stained red. The expensive watch on her wrist had stopped a few minutes after midnight. It remains unclear what happened to Pamela after she left the ice rink that night. There's no concrete evidence to tell us where she went, what she may or may not have got up to, or who she may or may not have bumped into. With all that said, two prominent theories do exist. Paul French and Graham Shepard have both published books about the murder mystery of Miss Werner, but the authors paint two very different pictures. In fact, the only thing they both seem to agree on is that Pamela's life came to an end with a blow to the head. I'll start with French's version of events, which he presents in his book, Midnight in Peking. After researching the case extensively, French believes it's most likely that after skating with her friends, Pamela met up with another group of females to go to a party. The party was being hosted by an American dentist in the city, Wentworth Prentice. Prentice and his friends were known for not being the nicest of people, put it like that. Not the kind of guys you'd bring back home to mother. Pamela was a patient of the bad boy dentist, and so likely didn't feel intimidated by him or his mates. Their party eventually moved on to another place, a seedy club in a place known as the Badlands. You can imagine what kind of things went on in that neighborhood. French claims that it's here Pamela was separated from her friends. There she stood, in a room with only a bed in it, surrounded by a group of men. From there, a number of things could have happened. Maybe she resisted. Maybe she screamed. Maybe one of the men panicked and hit her over the head with something hard to shut her up. Either way, that was both the end of the party and the end of Pamela. The men then drained her body of all her blood to make her lighter and easier to move. They took her to where she was discovered the next morning a place with no streetlights and few passers-by. Their plan was to chop up her body, make her unrecognizable, dispose of the pieces in predominantly Chinese areas, and pass the blame on to a non-existent local psychopath. The dentist and his friends were all hunting buddies, and all knew their way around a blade. They were likely interrupted when someone came by, and left Pamela where she was found. Graham Shepard's hypothesis about what happened that night is much different. The writer himself was a former police detective, and he claims that French's version of events doesn't make sense from a policing perspective. No, his version is much more simple, and goes like this. Pamela was not the kind of girl who'd go along with a group of men to the infamous Badlands. That would have been completely out of character for her. Even if the party actually happened, it's likely that she never went to it. 
it's more likely that she met up with one of her old Chinese schoolmates, a man called Han Su Ching. This man would be the one to end her life after she broke his heart sometime before. He probably dumped her body in the street late that night, and then some random passers-by harvested her organs to sell for some superstitious Chinese medicine practices. A dark theory indeed. Both writers have problems with each other's version of events, but in all likelihood, we'll never know which one, if either, is correct. In 1943, the Japanese army took control of Peking, and the investigation into Pamela's demise came to an end. After the war, all interest in the case faded, Whatever evidence had been collected was already lost. We know as much now as 82 years ago. Although the circumstances of Pamela's untimely demise remain a mystery, and probably will forevermore, at least these two books have shone a light on her case, and ensure that she won't be forgotten to history. The Sumter County Does, two unidentified murder victims who were found in, you guessed it, Sumter County, South Carolina. It was 6.20 a.m. on August 9, 1976, when a trucker came across two lifeless bodies lying by the side of a secluded dirt road. One was male, one female. They'd both been shot three times in almost the exact same places. Once in the back, once in the chest, and then once in the throat. First thing was first, the cops had to identify the two victims. And that turned out to be a lot more difficult than anyone imagined. So difficult, in fact, that even to this day, 43 years later, we still don't know who they were. What we do have are these facial reconstructions, and a few tidbits of information. Firstly, their rough ages. The male was aged between 18 and 30 years old, though was most likely around 27. The female was between 18 and 25. They were both Caucasians with olive-colored skin. They were both found wearing no underwear. Neither of them were carrying IDs or cash. There were no substances in either of their systems. They looked extremely similar, so much so in fact that the investigators assumed they were brother and sister. A DNA test in 2007 later proved they were not related. Both of them had a few distinguishing features. For instance, the male had an athletic body with several scars on his shoulders and back, suggesting he played contact sports. The female had very long eyelashes and two moles on her left cheek. They were both clearly from rich backgrounds, as they were wearing expensive clothes and jewelry, made using gold and precious stones. The male even wore a 14-carat gold ring encrusted with a sapphire. Engraved on the inside, were the letters J.P.F. Could these have been his initials? He also had extensive dental work done on his teeth, including a rare type of root canal, which only a handful of dentists in the US knew how to perform at the time. As such, he may have been a foreign traveler. Indeed, a campground employee who met the couple shortly before their killing said that the male's name was Jock. He said that Jock's father was a well-known doctor in Canada, Apparently, his family had disowned him for not pursuing a career in medicine, and he decided to travel to the US to pursue his dream of becoming a teacher. If that backstory is true, then maybe the employee misheard the male's name. His first name may have been Jacques, or maybe even Jean-Paul, both of which would have fit the initials on the ring. With so much information to go on, the authorities were confident that somebody would come forward to identify the bear. They placed the two does in see-through caskets and appealed for people to come forward and ID them. Photos of their lifeless faces were even taken and shared around. You can still find those images online today, along with pictures of the crime scene, though I don't recommend looking them up if you're squeamish. Anyway, things were looking pretty positive. After all, somebody must have known that these two were missing and were out looking for clues. Their families? Their friends? Somebody had to be searching for them. Well, a year passed, and nobody came forward. As such, the two does who died together were buried together, side by side, in Bethel United Methodist Church Cemetery, Oswego, South Carolina. They were briefly exhumed in 2007 for their DNA. 
so their identities remain a mystery. What about the identity of the perp? And that too, sadly, remains unknown. There are a few compelling theories out there, ranging from a carjacking gone wrong to the couple being involved in a narcotic smuggling scheme. They may have just simply been hitchhikers that ran into the wrong guy. With all that said, there was one lead back in the day that seemed really compelling. In fact, it's weird that it never came to anything. In 1977, only one year after the incident, a man was arrested for driving under the influence. His name was Lonnie George Henry. In his possession was the same gun used to shoot both of the does. It looked as though the cops had stumbled upon the culprit. Well, that's the thing. The man was never charged with anything due to insufficient evidence. The authorities never expanded on this, not publicly at least. Lonnie passed away five years later, taking who knows how many secrets about the case with him. Even if he wasn't physically involved, he must have known something about what happened. Why the cops let him go is anyone's guess, though most people agree there's more to this case than meets the eye. Whatever the case, for the past 43 years, these two young people, whose lives ended so tragically, have been resting without names or identities, and things will likely stay that way forevermore. Unnamed headstones mark their final resting places. Earlier this year, police in Australia reopened their investigation into a 30-year-old case, that of Robbie Joe Coulter. In 1989, Robbie Joe's decomposed body was found at the bottom of the Murray River in New South Wales. It had been weighed down with chains and mill bricks. His hands had been bound behind his back. He was only 17 years old. Initially, the police were confident that there was no foul play involved, which does seem crazy given the circumstances. Now a more chilling picture is being pieced together, one in which Robbie Joe wasn't the victim of a freak accident, where he tripped and fell into a mass of chains connected to bricks, and then mistakenly tied his hands behind his back before falling in the river. Who'd have thunk it, right? No, the truth behind the mystery is likely far more sinister. Here's the main theory. Robbie Joe was last seen walking home from a party in the early hours of New Year's Day. He was travelling along the side of a road, so it's possible that a person or group pulled their car up alongside him, forced him into their vehicle, and then drove him out to Murray River. Then, by the water, they wrapped chains around him, attached bricks as weights, tied his hands behind his back, and tossed him into the river while he was still alive and conscious. They may have been people he had somehow offended at the party. They may have been people Robbie Joe knew. They may have been complete strangers. Nobody knows. Well, nobody claims to know at least. As Robbie Joe's own mother said on a radio show, I'm convinced that all of his mates know what happened. I don't know why they're staying so silent. We still don't know what happened to Robbie Joe after that New Year's party, but even after 30 years, his family refuses to stop asking questions. Now, with the case being looked at once again, they may well find some answers. Robbie Joe's sister recently made a post on social media that sums up the horribleness of this incident. She wrote, I can't possibly imagine the fear that filled his soul as he sank to the bottom of the Murray River with 21 kilograms of brick and chain wrapped around his body. Finally, we have a mystery of biblical proportions. Three decades ago, 15-year-old Emanuela Orlandi, who lived within the walls of the Vatican City, mysteriously disappeared on her way home from a music lesson in Rome. 3,000 posters of her face were plastered around Rome, and the story was big news and made headlines all over Italy. People speculated that the Mafia was somehow involved, or that people in the top echelons of the Vatican had something to do with the girls vanishing. Serious stuff. Regardless, Emanuela was never found. She was allegedly last seen getting into a dark-coloured BMW. There were several reported sightings of Emanuela just after she disappeared. 
A 16-year-old boy who called himself Pierre Luigi phoned up the authorities and said that he had just met the missing Amanuela, giving details about her flute, her clothes, her hair, and the glasses that she hated wearing. Apparently, Amanuela was using a different name, Barbarella. A few days later, a bar owner calling himself Mario also phoned the authorities, saying someone called Barbara had stopped by. Her appearance was identical to a Manuela's. His bar was between Vatican City and Rome, right along the trail a Manuela would have had to walk to get home. When Pope John Paul II made an official appeal for the safe return of a Manuela, the authorities began to receive numerous calls from a man known only as the American. As you can guess, he had an American accent. The man claimed to be a part of a group that were holding a Manuela captive. He even played an alleged recording of a Manuela's voice over the phone. According to the American, his group had one clear demand. The release of the person who had shot the Pope in 1981. A man named Mehet Ali Agka. It remains unclear whether the American's claim was legitimate or just a hoax. Recently, the case has started making headlines again. Last year, an anonymous tipster sent a picture to a Manuela's family. It was a photo of a sculpture. The sculpture of an angel by the tombs of Princess Sophie von Hohenlohe and Princess Charlotte Federica of Mecklenburg at the Teutonic Cemetery. Along with the photo was a note that simply instructed them to look where the angel is pointing. Who had sent this tip? And why had they waited for more than 30 years to do so? All that Amanuela's family knew was that they had to follow this lead. It was all they had. The authorities were notified, and the Vatican agreed for the tombs of the princesses to be opened. This happened on July 11, 2019. There were no human remains inside either of the tombs, not even the remains of the two princesses who were supposedly buried there. The plot thickened. The authorities continued to explore the Teutonic College, hoping that the tip was legitimate. Recently, they made a discovery. Beneath the floor, they found two chambers. The chambers contained thousands of bones. It's currently estimated that the bones correspond to at least a dozen different people. They're currently being analyzed. Could some of these bones belong to a Manuela? If they do, what does that mean for the Vatican? And will it bring us any closer to finding out what happened to her on that fateful day, or who was responsible for her disappearance? This is certainly a case you should keep your eye on. It's both bizarre and dark in equal measure. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. Well, I hope you enjoyed these mysteries. Uh, I think there were some good ones in amongst this video. Certainly some ones I'd never heard of before, so uh, hopefully you hadn't either. If you did enjoy it, then make sure to smash that like button, or I'll smash you. Yeah, before we go, I'd like to say a very special thank you to all my supporters on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Connor Lofton, Sakis Leoliosidis, Madison Reinhardt, Kelly Rocco, Danny Elk, Joshua Lindsay, Darius Safai, Nadine, Mitchell Herrera, Sloane Crawford, Sarah Ramirez, Victor Javier Fonseca Ruiz, Maricruz Cardano, Anime Wimp, Crazy Mask Parade, James Labour, Procupidine Netta, Gina Valera, Philip Westra, Alex Greensall, Monica Mendoza, Crawford K. MacDonald, Marley Wright, and Ray Price Burton. Thank you very much, guys. Your support really helps the channel out. Make sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, all of those things. Hit that bell icon, and I'll be back with another video very, very soon. Until then, guys, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.